we're going to get to a part where people are not going to know what's true and what is not true. I mean, every politician is going to be the victim of a fake audio or a fake video. The evidence of our eyes is no longer necessarily going to be dispositive because you don't know whether something you're seeing is true or not true. And this this wave is about to hit us not in 10 years, but as you pointed out, over the next nine months. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We're going to take a little bit of a detour today because I've had this book around my house now for several months. I'm holding it up for you YouTube uh, uh, viewers. Uh, The End of Reality, How Four Billionaires Are Selling a Fantasy Future of the Metaverse, Mars, and Crypto by Jonathan Taplin. And and I got to say, it is it is scary. And since it is not necessarily in my wheelhouse, I really wanted to talk with you, Jonathan. So good morning. Welcome to the podcast. Appreciate it very much. Great to be here. Uh, by the I way, just a little t- bit of background. I mean, you you were a man of many, many careers. I mean, you put the Renaissance and Renaissance man. You were a tour manager for Bob Dylan and the band. I'm guessing there's a book in there somewhere. Film producer, most notably of Martin Scorsese's Mean Streets and The Last Waltz. Founder of the pioneering video on demand company Entertainer and Director Emeritus of the Annenberg Innovation Lab at USC. And this latest book, okay, I'll tell you what what got me what got me about your book, Jonathan, is I keep thinking, I, I always worry about while we're focusing on the big orange sun in front of us, and while we're fighting that what's going on in in the background and we're fighting authoritarianism and the guy who's going to be the dictator of the day and yet you think about all of these other things that are moving ahead including the the rise of an american oligarchy and i wanted to bounce that word off you because you write about these these billionaires and you call them the technocrats um but let's just for a moment and and again i don't, I don't want to sound like you know just sort of going through some sort of 1930s um, rhetoric, but the concentration of wealth in this country, you know, has been a growing concern. But the concentration of wealth, power, and influence feels like we're reaching a peak moment. Do we have an oligarch yeah. problem? So I have a chart I use when I when I give talks, which shows that the rise of the one percent really started around the time of Google's IPO. Uh, And and the thing is that the software, you know, technology is an extraordinary business. uh, And it it creates profits unlike anything we've ever seen in our life. I mean, if you just take Facebook with reported record earnings this week, um, Facebook doesn't have to make its product. The people make its product. It doesn't have to transport its product because the internet, which the government subsidizes, transports its product. All it does is take the majority of the advertising income for keeping people's attention. So its margins are in the 80% range. And just to give you an example, Google's gross margin is around 52%. Walmart's gross margin is around 30%, and Facebook's is like 80. (laughs) Um, So, you know, Reinhold Niemöller, the the famous theologian, said something really smart, I think. He said, uh, he said, and he said this in the late 30s, he said, some form of oligarchy would be inevitable in a technological age because of the inability of the general public to maintain social control over the experts who control the new technologies. And you and I have watched since the beginning of social networks, these people, the the barons, the tech barons, basically have free reign to do whatever they want. You, You can't sue Facebook, you know? I mean, for instance, uh, Rupert Murdoch paid seven hundred and fifty million to yeah, uh, Dominion for defaming mm-hmm. him, for putting out untruth. But there was far more untruth on Facebook and Twitter about Dominion mm-hmm. by a, a factor of fifty, because you know, at at its greatest, when he was on Fox, 
Tucker Carlson could get 3 million people a night. That was his size of his audience. Elon Musk tweets at least three tweets to 140 million people a day. And he makes sure they get every tweet he puts out unless you actively block him um, because he's tweaked the algorithms to make sure that everybody sees his wisdom. Um, so hmm. Elon Musk's power is far greater than, than Tucker Carlson's was at the height of his power. Um, someone said, democracy's assassins always need accomplices. And hmm. I am worried that these people, specifically Musk and Zuckerberg, but also Andreessen and uh, Thiel, are the accomplices to the assassination of democracy that we're watching as a kind of slow motion train wreck that's going on. Well, I, th let's, let's talk about those, those four guys, because your book, The End of Reality, is about those four billionaires and how they're selling out our future. And, and you're right, four very powerful billionaires, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and Mark Andreessen, are creating a world where nothing is true and all is spectacle. If we are to inquire how we got to a place of radical income inequality, post-truth reality, and the looming potential for a second American civil war, we need to look no further than those four, the biggest wallets, to paraphrase historian Timothy Snyder, paying for the most blinding lights. Now, you know, that that is a sweeping in, indictment because, of course, we have... We have, you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of pundits and, and, and scholars who are, you know, looking for sources of, you know, economic discontent and sociological changes. But it really does come back to these four incredibly powerful oligarchs. And, and also it explains why the transformation has been so rapid. I mean, this is the thing is you, you look at things, trends and changes that used to take 100 years, then took 50 years, then took 20 years, then took, I mean, and now we're measuring it in, in virtually a news cycle. So so let's talk about this. You you call these four billionaires the technocrats, and, and you describe them as essentially an interlocking directorate of Silicon Valley. I mean, it's not like four separate guys. There is a you know, for, the, for all the conspiracy theories out there, you know, if you're, if you're looking for the Illuminati or, you know, the, the, the secret cabal, this is the interlocking directorate of Seneca, Silicon Valley. How does it work? Well, first off, they all invest in each other's companies. So when Elon Musk wanted to buy um, Twitter, he looked to both uh, Mark Andreessen, who put 400 million mm -hmm. into the deal, uh, he looked to Peter Thiel, who has always been an investor with him since the first days of PayPal. They they owned PayPal together, Peter Thiel and, and Elon Musk. Uh, mm -hmm. Mark Andreessen is a board member of Facebook and a large one of the earliest investors. Peter Thiel was the original investor in, pay, in Facebook and was a board member until very recently. Mm -hmm. um, Teal invested in SpaceX. Andreessen invested in SpaceX. I, I mean, you can see how it works. When I call it an yeah, interlocking right. directorate, they it's all invest in each other's deals. And so they're all deeply embedded in the same thing. And, and in a sense, they all want the same thing, which is why they're all supporting Donald okay. Trump. What what do they all want? You write that, that the, these oligarchs appear to be more interested in replacing our current reality and our economic system with something far more opaque, concentrated, and unaccountable, which if it comes to pass, they will control. I mean, so it's not, it's not enough for them to be richer than hell or cool or named Time Man of the Year. What do they really want here, Jonathan? Well, their ideal world is the kind of libertarian anarcho fantasy, which is a world in which the currency is Bitcoin. So it's untraceable and nobody knows who owns what and nobody can find out. The world that people in, inhabit is a virtual world the metaverse in which 
uh, because you're out of work, you're going to spend hours and hours in some fantasy world that Mark Zuckerberg will will essentially rent to you. You know, in other words, mm -hmm. let's say you're a Tony Stark fan in the Avengers. Um, you can rent Tony Stark's house and he will give you Tony Stark's magic suit that he wears and he will even rent you the avatar of Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> to date for a night uh, because you're lonely and you have nothing else to do. Um, and for Andreessen, the world takes a little darker turn, which is, of course, Andreessen's company is the largest vendor to the Pentagon of autonomous weapons. And autonomous weapons right. is a new thing in which AI makes the decision as to when to pull the trigger. It's not some guy <laughs> in a trailer in Las Vegas directing a drone and pulling the trigger from Las Vegas. It's completely independent. And that assumes like sci a sci that the AI that will I've know seen. That assumes the AI will know the difference between a man with a gun and a man with a broom at 150 yards. And it hasn't worked out that well in the early test. But that isn't to say that surprised. Andreessen doesn't think that that's the future. And of course, you know, all this notion of libertarian fantasies, if you really look at them, they're all crony capitalists. SpaceX yeah. is totally financed by the U.S. government, by NASA. Um, Musk's satellite company is totally funded by governments. Uh, Peter Thiel's Palantir is totally funded by government grants and government things and was originally founded by with CIA money. Um, yeah. you know, so much for being libertarians. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, this notion that they're really libertarians is actually a joke. They're just really good yeah. crony capitalists. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's a joke or, or I think the technical term is uh, bullshit. OK, so let's go through the lies, because this is kind of at the heart of, of your book, which is the end of reality. So let's let's talk about currency. Let's talk about A.I. Let's talk about let's talk about, you know, the metaverse Mars. But let's, I want to start on currency and how this how this plays that these guys are obsessed with the end of centralized banking Um Wall Street Journal just had a piece that crypto is being marketed to baby boomers following this SEC approval. So um, and BlackRock is is in on it. And, you know, right. people are out there, you know, trying to buy Bitcoin. So how does this fit in? What 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 is what is the role of this selling the fantasy future? Where does crypto fit in? Well, Bitcoin is basically controlled by what in the trade and is called the whales and the whales are the people they're about 3% of the holders of the Bitcoin and they control about 82% of all the Bitcoin. And so if you were just an average person like you or I and watching a football game, an NFL game in the winter of 2021, so say late November leading up to the Super Bowl of 2022, most of the commercials were for crypto. There was Larry David telling you to buy crypto. There was Matt Damon telling you fortune belongs to the bold. There was LeBron James and Tom Brady and everybody. And so what happened at that point, crypto was at $60,000 of coin and the suckers flooded into the market. Of course, the whales were happy to sell their coins at 60,000 and by April, Bitcoin was down to 19,500. So the, the, the pyramid scheme guys got out and the suckers bought in, just like every pyramid scheme. Kind of an old and it's story, never right? gotten back to the 60,000. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Bitcoin has no actual inherent value, at least with gold, which was the previous kind of, you know, prepper, thing of choice, you can melt it down and make jewelry or something, right? right? But Bitcoin has no value other than what some person ascribes to it. So it's a pure casino economy. You know, at, at some point, it, it, the game ends, you know, 
Uh, right. And and but it's it's just it has no value other than what it is. Okay. Okay, but what's their motivation? If I was a multimillionaire, if I was a billionaire, the one thing that I would not want to mess around with is the the integrity of the currency. I would not want to have my billions of dollars suddenly um, evaporate in value or be questioned or so why are they interested in this? Well, what is these, what, how does this fit into their agenda? What they want? These are ideologists. Peter okay. Thiel has been railing against the Federal Reserve before Ron Paul. I mean, these people have essentially tried to convince you that the U.S. currency is a total scam and it's just all kept afloat by uh, talking points and things and the fact that we're the reserve currency. They don't even understand how critical the fact is that the, we're the, the basic currency for the world is to the, the power of our economy. So they're coming at everything from an ideological point of view. Okay. They want complete freedom. That's why, for instance, they hate the current regime. Lena Khan, who is the head of the Federal Trade Commission, is the person that they throw darts at every day in in their private time, you know, because she's mm -hmm. sued Google, she's sued Amazon, she's sued Facebook, she's sued all these. And, and so their feeling is, Look, if we can get Biden out of there and Trump back in, it'll be a free ride again. And we won't have to worry about government regulation, which is the old, you know, Koch brothers scheme that the government sure. is bad because it tries to regulate my business. It gets gets out of the way. OK, so let's spend a little time on AI because you have some really good stuff in in this book of, about AI and, and where it's yeah. going. And, and you've been pointing to these comments from, you know, Sam Altman, you know, the CEO of OpenAI that – that copywriters and ad agencies won't have jobs in 10 years because they're all going to be replaced by chat GPT. So, you know, you know, so we're talking about millions of workers, white collar workers, millions of others like radiologists reading x-rays. They're going to be out of work. How disruptive is AI going to be? And I'm going to get to the impact on democracy in a moment. But right. just it, give me your thoughts about what's coming our way. Uh, with AI well, in terms of just, you know, our, you know the economy. Here's, here's the thing that scares me the most. So Sam Altman has Indeed. said, and Sam Altman is the CEO of OpenAI and is really probably the biggest thinker in the business. So Sam Altman has said that the marginal cost of intelligence because of AI will drop to near zero in 10 years. That means the cost to get any job of that requires a brain will be near zero um, because of these okay. machines. Okay, so let's just assume, I, I have a friend in LA who ran the largest public relations firm in, in Los Angeles, in Hollywood. And, and he had, at the height of his business, he had about 100 employees. And about 70% of those people were content creators. In other words, they spent the day writing press releases, thinking up stunts that, that Madonna could do, you know, just creating content. So he said to me the other day, he said, well, if I had started that agency now, I would have four salesmen to get us business. And I'd have a big chat GPT and two or three editors just to tweak what the output of of that was. So these are people who were making $150,000 a year. I mean, the old thought was, oh, the robots will put out of work the people who used to right. flip hamburgers for McDonald's. Yeah. But these are, these are middle-class jobs. So can you imagine uh, millions of middle-class people being replaced by AI? And, and perhaps a lot of them are young and took out a good deal of debt at college to go to USC's the Annenberg School of Communication. And, and now they got their first job at a PR or an ad agency. And then they're told, hey, sorry, the, the AI is going to do your work. You're out of work. Yeah. Um, For the next 40, 50 years. To me, years. That, that is a potentially revolutionary situation, i.e. 
you know, the oh. pitchfork brigade so, comes out. So, so, so Altman can, can, says, can, yeah. yeah, we'll need universal basic income. In other words, the government will have to step in and just pay everybody a basic thing to stay home in their pajamas every day. And, and you and I can debate what the role of work is in what me giving you meaning. I think it's pretty strong. I think work is mm -hmm. a lot of what gives us meaning. And if we didn't have work, what would we have meaning? Now, now maybe you would say, well, that advertising copywriter really wanted to write a novel his whole life. And so now he's got some basic stipend sure. and he can write his novel or form a band and become an artist, or it seems like everybody wants to be an actor or be a director. <laughs> and maybe that's because I live in Hollywood. But the point is, I'm not sure. Hundreds even of millions if, of people separated from the workforce. I mean, if you want to talk about potentially revolutionary upsides and downsides, obviously. Well, you know, there's two visions of what the future is. One looks kind of like Blade Runner, right? Where there's mm -hmm. a huge police perform, you know, police hovering in the air in their mm. things, and 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 you know the world is kind of broken, and the the millionaires love, love, love live the behind movie. Not sure that I want it for my future. I mean, that's <laughs> so right. We don't want Blade Runner now. Sam Altman, who's been pushing universal basic income, thinks that it'll be great. That it'll allow everybody to be what they really wanted to be because they didn't really want to be writing ad copy. They really wanted mm. to write a novel. Um, yeah. So that would release mountains of bad novels, bad music, bad... I mean, you know, there was an article in, yeah. in the New Yorker this week about Lucian Grange, the head of the Universal Music. And he's the biggest problem is there's too much junk out there. There's stuff no on Spotify kidding. that's so, just nonsense. And, and, and so you know, has Sam Altman, though, has, yeah, has Sam Altman met Republicans? Has he met the political class? Does he honestly believe that, you know, with the advent of AI and all of this displacement that we're going to have a Republican Congress and a Republican uh, president who are going to go, you know, let's put everybody on the universal dole. <laughs> I'm just dying. That's what I say. I I'm say, a little I say it's a fantasy. <laughs> I say it's a fantasy. But the problem is, Charlie, that nobody is, from a political point of view, is really talking about the reality of what AI is going to do to the workforce. Nobody is doing it. Um how and, fast does this happen? I mean, what, what is well, our he, Okay, so he says, ten, he says in 10 years, it'll be everywhere. And he, ten you know, Allman says in 10 years, there will be 30 to 40 million people unemployed for sure. And and you have talked about deaths of despair and stuff like that. And, and you know, needless to say, Trump is was elected president partially because of you know, outsourcing of jobs to China, but this is a different kind of thing. This is outsourcing jobs to robots and AI. It, it is, it is, yeah, it is inconceivable that you could not have a disruption of that size, 30, 40 million unemployed without it having absolutely cataclysmic, catastrophic political consequences. Um, this would be, I mean, this would, would, would be a real black swan event just on the economics without even getting into how AI can change our politics and what it will mean right. for disinformation I mean, and, and lies. Well, that's a critical point. We're going to see that yeah. in the next nine months. I mean, if you don't think that yeah. the AI use of disinformation is going to be astonishing, in, I mean, already we had, you know, a, a robo call from Joe Biden giving people yeah. the, the wrong date to go vote and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the use of disinformation, um, I, I noticed it's yesterday. It's like a, rain, a was, raindrop in advance of a tsunami, though. Right. right? 
There was there was an extraordinary thing that happened uh, about four days ago in Hong Kong. Uh, the chief controller of a very large Hong Kong company is asked to get on a conference call with four people, like a Zoom call. So there are mm -hmm. four faces, and and there was the chief financial officer, which he knew very well, and three other executives of the company on this robocall. And they say, okay, Charlie, we want you to transfer 200 million Hong Kong dollars to these five accounts. And that was the guy, he knows his voice, he knows his face, he's, he says, okay, and he, do, and he goes and does it, right? Well, they were all dollars. built by AI. They weren't the real people at all. It was a bunch of hackers okay. who built, who had recorded their voice, had recorded their f pictures and their, their some video of them and created oh, these avatars okay. that were totally realistic and convinced the guy, the controller, to, to transfer $200 million out of, out of their accounts. So, I mean, so people, we're going to get to a part where people are not going to know what's true and what is not true. I mean, every politician is going to be the victim of a fake audio or a fake video. Um, the, 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 um, the evidence of our eyes is no longer necessarily going to be dispositive because you don't know whether something you're seeing is true or not true. So you could have something that's fake that's being pushed, but then you could have something that is absolutely true that is debunked by all of this. And this this wave is about to hit us, not in 10 years, but as you pointed out, over the next nine months. So, yeah. you know, people like Hannah Arendt have been writing for years about that the point of propaganda was not to convince you of one policy or another policy. It's to get you to doubt your critical uh, sensibilities altogether. It is the annihilation of truth. You just don't know what's truth. So you basically just pick a side. This has been coming with a world we understand, we live in. How bad is it going to get, Jonathan? Well, on the outside, you could imagine a, a video of in late October of Biden having a total freeze up moment like Mitch McConnell. Right. Okay. And, yep. and, you know, completely created by AI. Yeah. And that would go viral. Instantly. And even if it was debunked almost immediately, it wouldn't matter. Because once it's out there on X, it's everywhere. I mean, because, you know, Musk has no desire to put forth the truth. Last week, he wrote on X, I just learned that all these illegal aliens will be allowed to vote. They're coming over the thing. Right. Now, this is a completely untrue thing. Right. But he, he said, and he said, I find this rather disturbing. So this tweet Lied. went out to about 72 million people. And most of those people think Elon is a god. And so, of course, they believe everything he says, you know. So, I mean, we are, we're going to create a kind of propaganda that no one had, can ever imagine the way it was in the past. It, it, and, you know, you, you quoted Tim Snyder, who's a professor at Yale in the beginning, and he said, to abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. The biggest wallet yep. pays for the most blinding lights. And these yep. guys are the biggest wallets and they're paying for the blinding lights. And you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have much uh, trust in anything, as you say. No, so just a little historical perspective. I was trying to think back on, you know, this is not the first time that we've had, you know, massive concentrations of both wealth and power. We had the robber barons of the late 19th century, how much of the economy they controlled, you know, the railways. But it's hard to come up with anything in which the non-governmental oligarchy had this much sweeping power, not just in politics, but in the economy and in the culture. 
Um, now, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm naive. Maybe somebody's going to say this is the way that it always used to be. But but certainly in modern liberal democracies, it's hard to come up with a parallel. And I think it would be even harder to come up with a parallel in which there was this kind of concentration of oligarchic power in which the liberal democracy successfully uh, made it through. What am I missing? Well, the reason earlier ages of oligarchy, and you mentioned the robber barons. So the reason that John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan were actually brought to heel by Teddy Roosevelt was that there was an independent press that investigated them. And, you know, a very courageous woman, Ida Tarbell, wrote a series of articles about how Rockefeller completely controlled the oil business and how he squeezed his competitors mm -hmm. and right. everything. And it caused outrage. But these people, and, and needless to say, Rockefeller had no control of communications or media. He was just an oil man, right? But here's Musk. He's a rocket man. He's a car builder, and he controls one of the largest communication networks in the country. And the same with Zuckerberg. So I, I think you're right that there is no parallel anywhere close to this in terms of the accumulation of power. And there's one other thing, which is that these people were given, unfortunately, by Bill Clinton and Al Gore, a pass which is called Section 230 of the Communications Decency mm -hmm. Act, or otherwise known as the Safe Harbor. In other words, you cannot sue Facebook for putting lies on platform because Facebook says, oh, well, yeah, we're we not have a publisher. nothing to do with this. We're just a platform. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. this is nonsense. You know, you notice that there's no porn on Facebook, and that's because they spend hundreds of millions a year with AI to filter out porn. Uh, if someone tries to post porn, and I've done some research on this, and porn is uploaded to Facebook about 800 times a day, but it all gets caught on the upload and shunted to another queue, and a human looks at it, and if for some reason it was a Margaret Mead ethnographic clip from National Geographic, maybe it'd be allowed on the platform, but otherwise it's put in the trash bin. So they have a they have a pass that a hell of a job only they're the only business that has a liability shield uh in America. So Okay, so how do you fight back against all of this? I mean, I, I don't want to end this, you know, with the, the sort of the doom and gloom. You and you talk about this in your book. You you talk about collective action, like what happened with the entertainment unions last year. I mean, that was a win, right? I mean, you had we were right on the precipice there. So um, collective action can, if not stop this, at least slow the roll. Well, I mean, you fight back in two ways. One, you fight back like the actors and the and the writers did last year, which is say to the AI companies, you cannot take our content and ingest it into your systems. And by the way, everything you've ever written or done on video is in chat GPT. I checked that out. Okay. So they've taken your content to make stuff for new uses, which only, they get all the money and you don't get any of the money. So you can't. So, so do I, I that. could be. I, I could be. Uh, I could actually be doing a podcast for the next fifty years, but it's not me. I mean, it, it's, right. it's getting to that right. point, right? Okay, right. right. But also, right. like the New York Times, if 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 you ask Chat GP to give you an answer to a question, and it just spits back to you a quote from the New York Times, which is an ingested, but there's no link for the New York Times to get any revenue. That's the thing. If you if you want a piece of art, I can ask uh, one of the you know art diffusion AIs, give me a picture of Joni Mitchell in a Western saloon in 1850. Yeah, and right, man, right. in three seconds, it'll give me that picture. But how did you know. get that picture? Because it ingested. Mm -hmm. 12 million images from Getty Images without permission, all of them copyrighted, mm -hmm. 
and use that to tell its AI what Joni Mitchell looks like, right? So right. That's, that's one thing. The second thing is, I think we've got to get rid of this safe harbor, Section 230. And last week, Klobuchar and a few other people started talking about that, that we have to just get rid of it. There's one senator named Ron Wyden, who for reasons <laughs> unknown to me, is so protective of that, that he won't let anyone touch it. He thinks it's, it's what keeps the internet what the internet is. Um, and then, you know, a lot of it is personal strategies. You know, just be educated. Don't, don't spend all your time on, on your smartphone. Look up, you know, uh, you know, read books, you know, get real wow, information from the sources, you know, uh, I yeah, know. That, that... That that feels like sort of a, a a twilight what you do on the on the on the desert island. But see, see, I I've always been skeptical about the ability of legislation to catch up with this. But I you you persuade me though that you know if you had legislation that would would hold that you know statements and representations made by a company using AI that are a total lie should not be considered immune from lawsuit, right? I mean, there's other right. possible legislation that would require AI companies to label fake pictures or writings as fake. That seems to right. be reasonable. And then, of and course, there's also this, this ongoing demand, you know, demand compensation when a body of work is, is, is basically pirated uh, to train AI programs like, like this very high-profile lawsuit recently filed by the New York Times. So I mean, you can right. have legal answers to this. You can have personal, but but also there 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 might be civil remedies, not remedies, yeah. not necessarily solutions. Well, look, I'm I'm on the board of the Authors Guild, and we've sued OpenAI too because, you know, you can ask uh, ChatGPT to write you a Stephen King short story, and it will write you a fairly convincing short story that is right in the style of Stephen King. Well, how did it do that? It put every Stephen King book into its system to learn how Stephen King writes. Uh, you can ask it, the Google LLM for music to write you a Bob Dylan Andy War song, and it'll sound kind of like Bob Dylan. It'll be kind of banal and, and not very good, but it will do it. And so, you know, that's that's the problem that we're facing. And it affects artists, it affects writers, it affects journalists, and eventually it'll affect millions of middle-class jobs. And, you know, I'm just worried that the society is not really thinking what that could be in terms yeah. of its effect on... We're totally, we're totally unprepared. Well, and let's get back to democracy as 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 well. It's hard to really understand the moment that we're in without discussing all of this other, uh, you know, the, this, this transformation um, that we're talking about where a lie can be um, both shielded from refutation, but also amplified beyond the wildest dreams of the, you know, the fraudsters and, and the, you know, and the, uh, and the charlatans of a previous age. And so, you know, here we are, you know, in early 2024 and half of us are looking like, wait, this guy, you know, has been lying about the 2020 election and now has convinced tens of millions of people to believe things that are demonstrable lies. In fact, he's convinced people to actually attack the Capitol and he's still running about this. And I, I think it's the irrefutability of lies and it is just the transmission of this kind of information that, and again, all the other explanations about what's happening in our politics have to, you know, I think you have to start with this. Because nothing else explains how America feels like a very different place in 2024 than it did, say, in 2015. I mean, this is what you're describing in your book, this right. post-reality world. Yeah, totally. It, it, you know, the postmodernists kind of led us down a very dark path from which we're going to have to recover. But, but I'm, I'm not sure how we do, you know. I, I just want to read you a, a little quote from Albert Camus, the rebel, because he, he was thinking about, you know, at earlier times when fascism was rising its head, 
um, he said, we are at the extremities now. At the end of this tunnel of darkness, however, there is inevitably a light which we already divine and for which we have only to fight to ensure it's coming. All of us among the ruins are preparing a renaissance beyond the limits of nihilism. I think what we're dealing with is a very nihilistic age. If you think about the TV content that you've been watching for the last 20 years, from The Sopranos to Breaking Bad to Mad Men, all Game these shows about horrible people doing horrible things to other people. It's all, and this started in 2001, right after 9 11, you know. And all these people, if that's what you watched and you saw that power was the only thing that mattered, then it's not that surprising that in 2015 someone said, well, Tony Soprano should be president. And that's what we got. And that's and that's and that's exactly what we got. Well, at least the good news is, though, that the holodeck is going to save us, right? That uh, we're going to get in, be able to go to the metaverse. Apple has this new, just incredibly overpriced, but really cool looking, um, uh, you know, set uh, v- VR set, and we're just going to be basically be able to go into our bedrooms and our basements and just live our best lives without ever actually leaving the house or interacting uh, with any human, real human income. beings anymore, right? <laughs> that's that's right. right. I mean, that's it'll, our future. It'll be right? like that be movie. Pods. It'll be like that movie, Wally. <laughs> I know. Wally. I, I can imagine that. Fat and sassy. <laughs> the, <laughs> we'll be very fat. The book is The End of Reality, How Four Billionaires Are Selling a Fantasy Future of the Metaverse, Mars, and Crypto by Jonathan Taplin. It is an extraordinary and necessary read for our time because either this is going to end or it's going to continue, but my guess is the oligarchs will still be among us. Jonathan Taplin, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It was a real pleasure, Charlie. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for listening to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.